Welcome back. We have an interesting topic for this hour. And we need you to help us with this. We're going to be talking about the ABCs of parenting heart to heart. So you need to help us out and tell us what you think the ABCs stand for. What do those three letters stand for in relation to parenting? Now, there are lots of options, but we want to hear from you. What do you think they stand for? What about the A? Accountability. Accountability. Have you heard this before? It's <laughs> <laughs> good. A good listener. <laughs> Accountability. Ah, do you think that's important to parenting? It is, especially if we're willing as parents to be accountable to God in trying to help our children to be accountable to us and God. Okay, whenever we think about the ABCs, we're talking about the building blocks, aren't we? Remember when your children were little and you had those little wood blocks, the ABC blocks, the alphabet blocks? Do you have those? All right. <laughs> I don't remember playing with them when I was little, but I certainly enjoyed playing it with them when my children were little, and I still see that it's a very popular um, activity for young children. And they're the building blocks, and when we think of, of newborns and the beginnings, we often have it illustrated through the ABCs, and that's why we picked this title for this message, because the building blocks of parenting heart to heart are truly words that begin with ABC, and we're going to discuss those today and we're going to find how they are illustrated in scripture. So we've discovered the A, it's the accountability and that is necessary in parenting heart to heart. What do you think the B would represent? Let's hear some ideas. Belief. Belief, Belief okay. in God. That's good. See there's going to be good. some good options here but this isn't what we're talking about. Okay? Don't be afraid. Speak up. Boundaries. Ah, very good. Does your daughter think boundaries are necessary? Or did she hear this before somewhere? She's got a big <laughs> smile on her face. All right. Okay, so we have the two. A was what? Accountability. Accountability. B is? Boundaries. boundaries. What would C be? Communication. Very good. That's a good one. Communication. That's not the one we have. I heard it back here. Have for oh, Christ that's is. The, yeah, that's the real foundation that's of, right. of this, these building blocks. But I heard it back here. Consequences. Consequences. You like consequences, dear? No, I don't. <laughs> Do you? No. <laughs> I don't think anybody does. I don't like the way they feel, but I like knowing why they have to be even the ones I get sometimes, because they're part of the building blocks. That's right. Character building blocks, right? Well, we want to take you back to the Bible because all the ABCs are represented in the Bible. And these building blocks need to start with the foundation of God's Word. So, I want you to go there to Genesis, right back to the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 2. And verse 16, Genesis 2, 16. And the Lord God, oh, go ahead, you want to Can interject something? Go ahead, sure. This, this, in these scriptures we're going to be looking at, we're going to identify these building blocks that were in, put in place when we live, when man was created and lived in a perfect environment. It's not something that, that was down the road somewhere in scripture. We see it illustrated through scripture, but the thing that impressed us the most was that a loving God in a perfect environment established the foundation of the ABCs of parenting because he's our father parenting us and these are the principles by which we begin to parent Amen. in our home. Genesis 2.16, and the Lord God, so who's, who are we talking about here? The Lord God, our father, commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. 
So of those three ABCs in this one verse, what, which one of those is being revealed here? Boundaries. boundaries. It's very Good. clear. The Good boundaries class. are being, <laughs> being clearly established and clearly understood. So how many trees could they eat of? All of them but one tree. Now that's a pretty fair God, isn't it? Amen. Is that a reasonable boundary? All these trees, and you can just one that I don't want you to eat of. That, that is very reasonable. So we see that God is reasonable in his boundaries that he sets. He doesn't make it complicated for us. Okay? Now we're going to go to Genesis 3, verse 7. So what we want to do here is we want to make the Bible come alive. Okay? Make it practical. This is a story that all of us have known probably for many years. I knew this story when I was a little boy. I read it many times, but it's only in recent years that the story has come alive for parenting, okay, the deep lessons. So Genesis 3, 7, and they heard the voice of the Lord. Who do you think heard the voice of the Lord? Adam and Eve, so you get the context here since we're not reading every verse. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And then notice in verse 9, the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Then in verse 11, Who told thee thou wast naked? So which of the ABCs is being revealed here? Accountability. God is calling for Adam. He's saying, Adam, where are you? Now, why would God have to be calling Adam? Because he wasn't there, right? Why do we call our children? Because they're not right by our side, right? And so I'll say, Emily, and I'm calling to her because I want to be with her, okay? Now, we know that, that God came down, and he was in the garden, okay? And he called to his son, Adam. He says, where are you? He knew where he was. Sometimes, do we as parents ever really know where our children are when we call them? Yeah. Yes. Why do we call them? To make them accountable. So they can respond. We want to make them accountable. We want, in other words, we want to draw them in. We need to have some communication. We need to have some time together. We want that time. It doesn't have to be that we're calling because something bad has happened. We simply want time with them, whether that's on the positive side or if there is something that is legitimate that we need to address, we need to take the time to do that too. But accountability is what's being showed here. God calling to Adam, and next he says, Who told you, who told you, Adam, that you were naked? He wants Adam to be accountable. And he goes on and he asks, Another question, hast thou eaten, there in verse 11, hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded that thou shouldest not eat? Does God know if Adam's eaten of the tree? Here, if we stop for a moment and think about this, this is a parenting principle. Have you ever found yourself, and, and I believe every parent can relate to this, the first thing, we come on the scene and we say, why did you do that? Okay? Well, that's not what God did. God is showing us something about a parenting principle here, about this accountability. He says, who told you? Who told you? Who told thee that thou wast naked? He's trying to find out now how Adam is going to relate to his accountability. Is he going to be honest? Do we need to see if our children are willing to be honest? Does it make a difference? If our children are willing to be open and honest with us versus hiding from us and trying to cover it up, it makes a big difference. We need, as God did here, to know what our young person is going to say when we call them to accountability. And then in verse 12, notice the response of, of Adam. The man said, the woman whom thou gavest me to be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. <laughs> Almost like, she did it, and I couldn't help myself. Isn't that the excuse? I'm, you know, now God has said, I want, to, I want you to be accountable, Adam. And Adam finally 
agrees to be accountable, but he's only going to be accountable to blame somebody else. That's the first story in the Bible of blame, right there. Who's the blame? God is to blame. Ultimately. That's ultimately it. It's this woman. You made this woman for me, and she's supposed to be helping me. She's supposed to be doing me good, and she puts this fruit in my mouth. She did it. And if you had made her, I mean, this is how a human being who falls into sin begins to reason about blaming someone else. Why this happened to me. So, God makes Adam accountable first. Who took the fruit first? Eve did. Eve did. Why does God make Adam accountable first? Adam was the one. If you go back, it's very interesting. When you go back and really dig into the Bible, and I mean, you don't really have to dig in, but Adam was the one who got the instructions from God before Eve was even made. Adam was first accountable to God. And it is true that man, men will be accountable for our families. Okay? So there's an accountability here. But now let's go to verses 14 to 24 because we're going to find out that after God made Adam accountable, he made Eve accountable. And after he made those two accountable, notice what happens in verse 14 to 24. The serpent was cursed to go on its belly for all of its days. Why was the serpent the first to be called to account here? Why the serpent? What happened? What's the, the chain of events that took place? It was used as the tempter. The serpent was the tempter. So now the woman is going to have sorrow and pain in childbearing. The man is going to be having the ground cursed for his sake with thorns and thistles, hard labor and sweat of the brow. And together, Adam and Eve will be leaving the garden. So, so what part of the ABCs do we see demonstrated here? Consequences. It was clear, the boundaries were clear, the expectations were there, the... Um, accountability was called for when the boundaries were violated. And next, there are consequences that are applicable to the breaking of the boundary. I think this is very important. This is an area in parenting that most parents try to avoid, the consequence side. I mean, we did it when our children were young. And you know there's something about a two or three year old when they're sassy and when they do these things and they're first learning to talk and that we almost think it's cute. I mean, we, we laugh, oh, isn't that cute, you know? I mean, we've done it. But it's not cute because it's, it's a seed that's just beginning to be planted that's gonna have a terrible harvest. Because right. that little sassy, cute mouth that we call cute grows up to be disrespectful and um, unwilling to hear counsel. So we have to stop it, the wrong, in its infancy. And, and that's why we see immediate consequences here in the garden. Because God knew that if he didn't um, address the sin, if he didn't address the breaking of the law or the boundaries, that it would only get worse and worse and worse. So immediate consequences that were fair to the infraction of that boundary or that law. So the Apostle Paul in Romans 13, 1 says, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. You know, one of the things that everybody struggles with outside of Christ is this idea of being accountable to some authority. Okay? That's, that's a, an ageless problem with humanity is not wanting to be accountable to a higher authority. And you know, much of what's happened today, do you know that the ABCs have basically been stripped from the American way of life here? Did you know that? And it's happened, many people don't even realize it. They're just oblivious to it. But it's just been taken right out of the foundation, the fundamentals. I mean, when I was in school, and I don't mind sharing this with you, because the grace of God is sufficient. But when I was in school, 
I had such a paddling one time that I tell you I've never forgotten it. I can remember every detail of the principal's office. I can remember the, the words he said. And what I really remember was the size of the paddle that he used on me. <laughs> this is not an exaggeration, friends. That paddle was custom made. And it had holes bored in the paddle part that were one inch in diameter. And I saw that and I trembled. I did, literally. My, my buddy, who was the next in line, when I got called in, he, I, he said, are you shaking? I said, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I went into the principal's office, and the principal was there, and my teacher was there, and they told me you know, what my consequences were, <laughs> how many of them I was going to get, told me the position to get into to make it very effective. <laughs> and my principal, just before he administered it, said, this is a lesson that I hope you will never forget. I never have. Indelibly impressed upon my mind and body. <laughs> and I tell you, that doesn't happen today in schools. And it's a tragedy, friends. It is a tragedy to the American Constitution. It is a tragedy to the Word of God. Now, it didn't have to be a paddle that big, OK? But I tell you that it didn't do me any lasting harm. It did me an awful lot of good because it made an impression. And I was guilty as charged, OK? And I don't, you know, I didn't make any excuses because I couldn't make any excuses. And it wouldn't have done me any good to make any excuses. But the point is this, consequences have been something that have basically been stripped and in order to strip the consequences from our nation, we've had to get rid of boundaries. Boundaries have been removed so that we live in a society and we know people personally that we've talked to that have been called before the courts. People that have been called before the social services because of simple biblical boundaries in their homes. Now, I'm thankful to say that all the people that we know have been exonerated by God's grace. Amen. But isn't it sad that we live in a generation where the young people, as a whole, in our society, are degenerating, that they are not living within rules and boundaries, can get away with so many things, to the point that a parent who is brought to the place of having to correct their child might be called up by social services for doing what God's word says to do. Isn't that a a sad state of affairs it's where we live today. And I tell you, it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. But it doesn't have to be so in our homes. We can have the ABCs in our homes that will make the difference so that our young people can shine as lights in this wicked and perverse generation. And the, the, the awkwardness of talking about boundaries and accountability and consequences, it's not a comfortable topic for today, but it's needed because we're not talking about abuse. We're talking about how to uh, parent heart to heart, that these are reasonable boundaries, right. that accountability is necessary, and yes, consequences are needful at times. It's all a part of God's plan. The scriptures tell us that the way of the transgressor is a hard way. And you know what we have done as a people in the United States of America? We have made the way of transgression easy. We have made it pleasant. And we are reaping the consequences in this nation today because of that. That's right. So God wants us to go back to the word, what we can trust in, that we know is sure, and we can build off the sure foundations of his word in the ABCs of parenting. So we're not afraid to talk about that, but we want to talk about in the positive way. And we know for our own selves that we were actually undoing these things in our home when our children were little. We began to make excuses, not intentionally, but saying things that would excuse away a violated boundary the lack of accountability because we didn't really want to have to deal with consequences because we were beginning to believe that if we ever gave our child a consequence or a correction that they were that we were mean parents 
It is a loving parent who loves their child enough to keep them from doing evil. Amen. Did you hear that? It is a loving parent, a godly parent, who will love their child enough, who will keep their child from going the wrong way, from doing evil. If my child is ready to come out and put their hand on my wood cook stove, because any of you have ever used a wood cook stove, the whole stove can be hot. It's not just a burner. If they're going to put their hand on that, and I know they're going to get burned, is it loving to go and pull them away in haste? In, in, in uh, you know, with, with, you know, quickly? Maybe even say, stop! In other words, to say something so clear that it's going to grab their attention, they're going to stop. Oh, honey, you know, that's not really a very good idea if you touch your... You know, I wouldn't do that if I were you. It, is that a loving parent? Because it, it kind of gets bypassed, and they go, and they, huh, you know, that's not a good idea. It's a loving parent that wants, that we want to keep our children from harming themselves and from going the wrong way, from getting burned in, in the things of this life. And, you know, ultimately, the parallel goes all the way through to the end. The wicked will eventually perish by fire, and the righteous the lovely, those are Christ's life, will be redeemed forever. And in our experience, we found ourselves, when our children were little, unconsciously, unknowingly, just fitting in with everybody else, making excuses for our children's behavior. And I'm sure some of you have done that. I can remember being with, my, with Allison when she was quite little, and you know we'd be in the store or something, somebody would come and say, Hi, how are you? You know, just, maybe it was a grandma who just, you know, how... You just are attracted to little children, and you want to just say something, and you're happy, and you're smiling, and, you know, and then what happens to the child? Most children, what do they do? Do they say, they do respond? Most of the ones I've met don't respond. They do respond, but they respond not to me, and my child wasn't responding to that person. They hide behind mother. They, they turn their head. They don't look. They, they peek around, and they don't look. They, you know, they're pulling on my skirt or, you know, whatever. They're hiding. And then what do I say? I'll tell you what I said. Same thing many of you said. What, what do we say? They're shy. They're shy. Oh, I mean, she's just shy. And I believe she was shy. And so I kept, you know, and it wasn't just happening with strangers. Then it would be people we knew. Oh, she's shy. But she wasn't shy at home to get her way. She wasn't shy when she wanted something. She was very clearly an unshy child. And if she wanted to, you know, control the room or control the circumstances, she was capable of it because really she had more authority in the home in some, in some ways than we did. So what did we do, dear? Why don't you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> what do we do in those situations? You take the shy, quote, shy child, and you see that same child responding when their will is not being crossed, when they're not being expected to do something that you're asking them to do, and you find out that the shy child, and there really is a reserved child, okay? I've met a few reserved children, and they're very, they're lovely children. That child will always answer respectfully, will look you in the eyes and answer clearly. But the so-called shy child will hide behind mother's dress. I just had this happen to me at one of our family camps recently. And I greeted the child, and the child just had a dramatic response and ran behind mother's dress, and mother was mortified because normally the child is not shy at all, okay? And I just observed what happens when this child, as soon as I'm not asking this child to, good morning or how are you today or hello, I watched how this child reacts, and it's a very interesting thing. The more shy the reaction, quote, is the shy reaction, the more dramatic the reaction, the sooner and the more boisterous and wild will be the counter behavior when you're not looking at them. Now think about that. I've seen it over and over again. The, the more dramatic the reaction, hiding behind mother, the more dramatic the reaction, the more boisterous 
and disobedient the child will be. And I watched it. I watched for it to play out. And it happened in less than three minutes. Okay? I could have predicted it. In fact, the mother came to me later and was very apologetic. And she says, oh, I'm, I'm trying to work with this. And we yeah. are, aren't we, as parents? So we had to take our daughter, and we had to start doing some role playing. And what we did is we said, whenever you are asked by someone, you know, how old you are, or good morning, or a greeting like this, if we are with you, and you can trust that that person, we're, you're safe to answer that person respectfully. Now, we're not saying that children need to be, you know, somewhere out in Walmart and by themselves, if they happen to be by themselves for a moment, that they have to get into a conversation with a stranger. That's not what we're talking about. Our children came to recognize that when they're in the presence of their parents, they can always trust that the person that's greeting them can be responded to in like manner. Speak clearly. Good morning. Or, you know, hello. That's not a, uh, too great of an expectation. But without that expectation, those behaviors will grow into adolescence. We've seen it. They will grow as the child grows. And so in that role playing, we not only express to our children what, what we, the boundaries that we wanted to establish that weren't there before, but we also actually ask them, you know, I'm coming to you and I would be the stranger and I would say hello, how would you respond? And get them to verbally respond. And we developed also the expectation that there was always eye contact. You know when there's eye contact, there, that increases the level of respect. It's interesting that, that when we won't don't want to look at someone, we give a message that maybe we don't really respect that person. Not always, but in certain situations that can be the case, that a lack of respect is there. And so we've had our children learn to look someone in the eye and to be able to talk to them and be accountable for that greeting or for that question. So we practice this in our home. And that became the expectation even within our own family. It's interesting, the shy child just isn't out there. We don't make the same excuse in our home, but we allow the same behavior to take place in our home. So we began to change that in our home. And I remember, you know, Allison was a little older by that time, and Josiah was now, you know, old enough to talk and respond. And he, but he was still small, two, about two years old. And I was in a hardware store, and he was in the basket. He probably wasn't even two, and sitting in the little basket. And someone came by, and a gentleman who worked at the store, an older man, and he says, how are you today, fella, little fella, or something like that? And Josiah looked at him, and he said, fine. And the man was so shocked, because usually he gets a squalling child in the cart. And it gave us an opportunity to share a little bit. And it just makes us so happy. A little child has an opportunity to reach in the heart of older people and can just make their day just by a simple response of respect. That's right. You know, this, is, this carries over, this whole idea of boundaries, accountability, and consequences carries into every area of life. One of the things that we did with our children at the table was for basic rules of courtesy and politeness, okay? We found that sitting at the table, sometimes the children would just say, you know, give me the, you know, granola or you know, pass me the whatever. And we recognize that really isn't developing the courtesy. Okay, so here's what the typical parent does, and we were typical as well, and so we said, what do you say? How do you ask? Oh, please pass the granola. Okay, so then next meal, give me the potatoes. Can I have the potatoes? Pass the potatoes. What do you say? Please pass the potatoes. Now, what are you teaching your child there? You're teaching them how to wait for you to prompt them, right? <laughs> so we said, look, we're not going to do this anymore, OK? There's a, we're just asking for basic courtesy in the home. So we had a little family council, and we really encourage people to have family councils. Sat down together, and we talked about this, and we said, from now on, next meal, when we're sitting at the table, if you can't be courteous enough to ask for something politely, then we're going to just totally ignore you. 
and pretend that we don't even hear you. Because we had to try to, there's a boundary here. There's an accountability. There's a consequence. And it took one meal to get it in their minds and a second meal to get it well established. Not 21 days. I tell you, it takes 21 days. It does in certain things, I'm sure. But it took two meals to get it refined. And you know that our children, and we as adults, don't have any difficulty being just having normal, courteous behavior when asking for something. Is that, a, is that a hard thing? I know parents that have done this with their children, and I've seen them one year, and a, and a year later, I still hear them saying the same thing. How do you ask? Okay? How many years are we going to do this? Are we going to be saying this when they're 17 years old? How do you ask? Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> Somewhere between toddlerhood and marriage, we want to get them on track with these things, right? Here's another area that many of us don't recognize that we um, fall into. We call it the tired child. It's something the child doesn't want to do, and they whine, they fuss, they're crabby, they don't obey you, and, oh, he must be tired. Have you ever said that? We give, we give excuses to wrongdoing. And that's why as adults and as children, as they get older, they find it so easy to rationalize and excuse things away. The scriptures are very clear. There's no excuse for sin. If there was ever an opportunity for excuse, Jesus would have never had to die. There's no excuse, but we have a Savior who can save us from those things. He can forgive us when we do wrong, but we can't excuse them away. We need to learn and to grow. And so these are expressions that we often, as parents, as grandparents, as friends, we give our children that takes away, that erases the boundary, removes accountability, and obviously there's no consequence. Yeah, you know, he didn't get a nap today. He's tired. When we do this, and many times we were doing this without realizing that we were actually creating the excuse to violate a boundary that we, we thought was important. Mm -hmm. But we didn't understand this, and so we started recognizing, yeah, he's out of his routine. Well, she didn't, you know, she's overtired. <laughs> and what we're doing is we're protecting ourselves as parents and inadvertently protecting our children. So whenever we do that, we're stopping change. Oh, we're going backwards, really, is what we should say. Instead, we need to recognize that. And so if that child is too tired to do their math lesson, what happens, dear? Their excuse, they can go take a nap. First of all, we check, are you really being honest? Oh, yes, mother, I'm really, really tired. OK, honey, just go take a nap. Rest for about a half hour, an hour. And when you're done resting, you can get up and you can do your math during playtime. I'm not tired anymore. I I'm feeling better now. <laughs> I mean, can you understand how humanity works? <laughs> but there needs to be a boundary there if you're really tired. And sometimes they really do need some rest. That's right. But if all they're doing is, is trying to get out of math, I'm really tired. But if they find out that getting out of math means that they'll get a, they'll get a nap. <laughs> well, maybe I don't want to get out of math. I really don't want to take a nap, and if, I mean, if it means I have to do math during my playtime, I really don't want to get out of math right now, so let's just do the math. But if we take away those boundaries, we're leaving our children handicapped. We're leaving them, and we see so many handicapped young people today. I'm talking about young people, 18, 19, 20 years old, who are handicapped, that are trying to do handicapped in their social skills. If they're working at the grocery store or wherever they're working, they can't do anything but what the boss tells them to do. They can't see that, you know, the stock needs to be replaced. The boss has to tell them, we don't want to handicap our children like this, do we? We need to have reasonable boundaries and then reasonable accountability and reasonable consequences. The consequences, again, have to be applicable to the infraction of the boundary. 
And, you know, our children learn from us to make excuses for themselves because we as parents have said, oh, they're just tired. They didn't get enough sleep. They didn't get their nap or all the excuses we make. And then they get a little older and they're using the same ones. So we decided there are times our children are legitimately tired. So we're not talking about what's legitimate, but what we have to do is address the problem, the real problem, instead of trying to, you know, work out here and letting that be a temptation to use that too commonly. So what we did is we decided we needed to have regularity in our home, and that was a tremendous help to some of these areas. The boundary of regular schedule in the home, a regular rising time, a regular bedtime, a regular play time, a regular oh. meal time, regular school time, regular chore time, all those things in combination began to remove the, um, the potential for those excuses to come. So what about the not feeling good child? You ever had a not feeling good child? Oh, my stomach doesn't feel very good. Oh, I've got a headache. <laughs> Do you really know what's happening in those situations? Are we really tuning in to the ABCs? Are we tuning in to our children so that we know what's really taking place? Are they making excuses or do they really have something going wrong? This is where we have to deal with the cause and effect. If the effect is a headache, we need to be able to address that. If they've not been drinking enough water, you know, if they've got a stomach ache. But if, if it's the not feeling good child is happening because mother has made excuses, we've heard, what kind of excuses? things that we heard from people well when we start when they're young and we don't recognize what we're doing wrong then it grows and we actually excuse I've heard women mothers excuse their 20 and 20 and more year old young people for bad attitudes for speaking disrespectfully for treating someone with you know in a cruel way and snapping at them and in, in a public setting and the mother will say you know he's got a really bad headache he's not feeling good today Still in their 20s, mother's excusing the child's behavior. And it is a childish behavior, isn't it? And it, we're not helping our children. And, and it's when we recognize that it doesn't stop with the little ones. It goes through school age. It goes to young adult. And you know what's going to happen in their marriage? Well, they're already excusing themselves as well. But it's going to be a tough marriage ahead for them because they've always found a way out of being responsible and accountable for their own choices. Yes, there's times I don't feel good, but it's not a license to be irritable or to treat someone unkindly. And that's real life. God's grace is sufficient, no matter how bad we feel, that we can still have a spirit of kindness. We can still, still speak respectfully. So we have to be careful if we identify ourselves in some of these things that we recognize it will continue to grow and worsen unless we're willing to surrender ourselves and ask God to help us change, to help us see where we're going wrong so that we can change our course and change the course that our young people are going. That's right. You see, if we don't make our young people accountable now in these little day-to-day -day situations, do you think they will somehow pick up accountability? I tell you, the sad thing is, is that some young people only pick up the accountability because of very hard situations in life. We know people personally that have been behind bars. Now that's a dramatic example, isn't it? But you know, that's where they started learning. We know some young people that found out about accountability in the military. These are young people we know personally because they were kicking against the pricks and it wasn't just their fault, it was things that their parents had been instilling in them. These excuses that are being made, oh, he's just tired, you know, he's got a headache, you know, he's shy. All these excuses that have been made, and we're just using simple examples, but these grow with the young person and they're being excused and we're dealing with somebody you know right now that wanting to enter into a marriage and some of the things that the baggage that they're carrying into that is because of the parents and here they are young adults but they're they're dealing with some of these difficult things because the parents haven't really addressed themselves therefore they're making excuses for the young people and we can't do that if we expect our young people to be godly young people that are accountable before God and accountable to us. If we want our children to be accountable to God, we have to teach them how to be accountable to us as their parents, to authority. Everywhere around, authority is being um, 
looked down on. There's, there's no respect for authority. And it's because we're not training our young people in our homes to respect us as their parents. Therefore, they don't respect the neighbor. They don't respect authority. They don't respect God. So we have to see that it has a far-reaching consequence. And because we do love our children, and because we do want to raise them for God's kingdom, God's calling to our hearts as parents that we recognize the importance of having the ABCs in place because that's where we find our greatest joy and security is within the law, within those boundaries. I'm free as long as I live by the laws of this land. I have total freedom. So do you. And I'm, I can be peaceful. I can be happy because I'm living within the law. And that's the way it is in God's law. When we live within God's law, that is the law of liberty and love, we have total freedom. We have total peace. We have total joy. But when we violate those boundaries, when we step outside of that, is when we lose our freedom and consequences come. So what we're trying to help our children understand first and foremost is that accountability to us as their parents when they're little is accountability to God. Okay? As they grow up, we transfer that accountability through parenthood that it's accountability between our young person and God. Not that the parents pull out of the picture, but we are trying to make that transition, which we'll be talking mm -hmm. about in the next program together. We're trying to make the transition for them to become independent. Independent in a proper way. So if we're going to have them accountable to God, God's word says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession of sin is specific in nature, not general. Notice, true confession is always specific in character and acknowledges particular sins. They may be of a nature as to be brought before God only. There may be wrongs that should be confessed to individuals. They may be of a public character and should be publicly confessed. All confession should be definite and to the point. It's not enough to show by precept and example general confession to our young people. If I make general confessions when I've wronged my wife, I don't set the right example for my young person. When I wrong my wife, my young people have been able to see me come. If I wrong her, if I speak to her in, in a wrong way, in a wrong spirit, if I do something, my young people, if they've seen it, they will hear me confess it in front of them. If it's just something between the two of us, that's between the two of us. If it's just something in my thoughts, that's between God and myself. But it's always specific. I remember one situation that happened uh, not long before our son went away for aviation training. So he wasn't a five-year-old, okay? And we had a family visiting, and we were talking together, and mother made a very reasonable suggestion that Josiah didn't like. <laughs> and he made a comment that was disrespectful to his mother. He did it in a very diplomatic way. In other words, it's interesting that, that children, as they grow older, they do just what we do. They try to, you know, say it in a very calm, reserved, diplomatic response. But you know the heart isn't in it. It's just as, just, just as disrespectful as saying, no, I don't like it, and I'm not going to do it. It was just, you know, so, so it looked, looked good, you know, but it, it really wasn't. The root of the problem was the same. And the bottom line was he didn't want to do what was being asked, and so we called him on it publicly because he's doing it publicly. And it, you know, turned into an uncomfortable situation, and so we asked him to go to his room. Can you imagine that? Asking a 17-year-old to go to their room. Now, you've heard about time out, right, as a consequence. Many people misuse, misunderstand time out, and all it is is a free-for-all for a young person to go to their room and just have a free-for-all while they call it time out. We don't believe in that. What we do believe in is that rather than trying to force an issue at the moment when you're dealing with you know, a, a reasoning mind, that it's better to take a few moments. That time out for him was he knew that in a very short time 
probably five minutes or so, we would be down to talk to him in his room. So we went to his room, and when we came in, he was not happy that this had happened in front of this family. And so what we did is we brought him to accountability. We asked him, like God asked Adam, to be accountable. We didn't tell him. We asked him, so what happened? And he had to admit what happened. He started the situation. We followed through. And he recognized, as we talked about it, that it was reasonable. And what he done, had done was unreasonable. But now the bottom line was, what was he going to do about surrendering that to the Lord? Isn't that the bottom line for all of us? Mm -hmm. He agreed with everything we said, and it wasn't appropriate what he said, but he did not want to have to deal with his heart right at that moment. And I said, Josiah, you understand that you know, we, can't, we can't make that happen. You know what's taking place here. We're going to have prayer together. We prayed together. And you know, it's one thing that our children have learned. By God's grace, we will not leave you nor forsake you. He knew that this would not be, we, we weren't going to force it, but we're not going to cover it over. That's the law of the mind, okay? When a young person knows that they can trust us enough that we will stay by our consequences, we will stay by our boundaries, we will stay by our accountability, then it helps them to deal with it more quickly. Amen. Within five minutes, he was ready to deal with it. And he came back upstairs, and he stood before those people, and he said, I'm sorry for the way that I spoke to my mother, and I'm sorry for the influence that I've had upon your family. Would you please forgive me? Specific confession. With a heart that was free in the Lord, surrendered to God. This is what the ABCs is about, friends. Mm -hmm. We, we want to bring our young people to the point, not where we twist their arm behind them, but that, that won't work, you know? My son is 6'2 now. I, I can't twist his arm anymore. I mean, I might be able to, but you know what I'm saying? This is not how we, we operate. We want to teach our young people and train them that God's ways are the happiest and most fulfilling ways. God never forces. He, he asks us. He entreats us. He calls to our hearts. He never forces us. But when we yield ourselves to him, when we surrender, we find that we gain the victory in him. I remember we were in a little shop and uh, it was a second-hand store. And Emily, at that time, was old enough to read. She'd been reading for a couple of years. And I just wanted to see if they had a couple of things there. And I found one of the things I was looking for in the second-hand shop. So I went out to the, the clerk there at the desk to pay. And on the counter there by the little register was this cute little miniature uh, cabin, this little wood, wood, tiny wood house. Everything was so scaled. <laughs> to exactly as if it was a full, you know, a complete home that you could walk into. It was so cute. And she was looking at that. Right beside there was a piece of white cardboard with black felt letters on it that said, do not touch, <laughs> sitting right next to this little cabin. You have to understand, Emily likes the little things, she, little miniature things. Yeah, <laughs> anything that's tiny, she likes it. She's very detailed. And she was looking at that, and, you know, I mean, I looked at it. I thought it was cute, too, but I read the sign. I'm not going to touch that thing. <laughs> and Josiah was there, and Allison was there, and, you know, the man was checking me out, and all of a sudden, kaboom! She had touched the little door. The door was on hinges. She pulled the door open to see what was inside, and the whole house exploded. And the man behind, oh, you should have seen the expression on her face, and I'm sure my face wasn't too different. Shock! And the man behind the counter just looked at her very directly. And he said, did you see the sign? Well, I thought she had seen the sign. And I, know she, I knew she knew how to read. In fact, she told me later, Mother, I really didn't see the sign, but I thought she had seen the sign. But right there, it, the boundary was clear, wasn't it? She passed the boundary. Whether she missed it or not, she still passed the boundary. And I let her be accountable for herself. I didn't say anything. Because that man was teaching her a very important lesson. And she said, I'm sorry you know, that I did that. I'll pay for it, you know, that I broke <laughs> it. And, and then anyway, she was doing this. It was interesting to watch his expression because the other people who do this, other children who've done it, 
mother's there to rescue them. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry they did that. I'll pay for it, sir. Okay, it's no consequences. She had been learning to be accountable and to live within the boundaries. When that boundary is violated, even though she said she didn't see it, she still had learned to be accountable. She knew she wasn't supposed to touch other people's things. That's right. She knew that, whether there's a sign or not. It's, it, this is something we should be teaching our children in the home. And the thing exploded. Anyway, the long and short of it is, it was just one of those little booby trap type things. And the man started laughing. He said, oh, don't worry about it. A lot, it does it to a lot of people. He puts it all back together, getting ready for the next person to come in and pull the door open. <laughs> She learned a very valuable lesson. She is one who specifically doesn't touch. <laughs> but what about really hard situations? We've talked about a lot of little things that happen and are foundational to daily life. But what if you find yourself in a very difficult situation? I mean, where things are really going wrong. Let me share the experience of one family. Their son was in school. His grades were going down. The teachers were saying, he's, he's disruptive, something's wrong. They were suggesting to the parents that he should be put on Ritalin to calm him down. He was just, you know, and it was getting worse and worse, and the change wasn't coming. And so they worked with him at home. They tried to talk to him. It got worse. Finally, the parents knew that they had to do something. They had been praying for God to give them direction. And so they made a very difficult decision. When their son got home and went to his room, as it was his, his usual to go to his room, where he had all of his sports equipment, his computer games, all those things that he was involved in when he got home, there was a big padlock on his door. He could not go in his room. And he was shocked, and his parents were there to meet him, and they began to explain to him that from this point on, for six weeks, he would only enter his room for 15 minutes in the morning to get dressed, and 15 minutes in the evening to get undressed with supervision. He would not be allowed to do anything outside of his school time. He would eat all of his meals at home, sitting between his parents. He would sleep on the couch. You get the picture here? That boy got angry. And he said, I will call social services. And his father said, go ahead. We're giving you food, a warm home, good bed. Go ahead. Well, he didn't call. He's trying their bluff. You understand, this boy was in serious trouble, and he was pushing the boundaries, going beyond the boundaries, and his parents felt this is what they needed to do. Does it sound hard? It was hard, but I tell you, it was what the boy needed. In two days, in two days, people say to us sometimes, but this has been going on for years. It's been growing steadily. How many years will it take? We tell people, have hope. There's hope in Jesus Christ. You can see this change in days and weeks. We've seen it over and over again. In two days, they were getting calls from the teachers saying, we've never had anybody respond to this medication as quickly as this boy has responded. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> they didn't tell him that, you know, the, but you understand, these people love their son enough to draw boundaries that were incredibly tough. And they stuck by them. And they told him, if you violate any of these in the next six weeks, we will add a week for every violation. And if you do perfectly, it will not take any of the time off of it. They stayed with it. And I tell you, that, that young boy is a different boy today. And you know what the most blessed part of it is? He loves his parents for caring enough Amen. to stop him. Tough behavior, tough consequences demonstrated in the love of Jesus Christ. When God said Adam and Eve must leave the garden, how do you think that made Adam and Eve feel? And how do you think they felt when God placed an angel with a flaming sword at the entrance of the garden that they could not get? Is that serious? That's serious. 
when God needs to make a change, we as parents need to be willing for that change to happen through us. And God will give us the grace to go through whatever we need to go through. You know, there's a beautiful text. It's found in Isaiah 49. 25th verse. It says, For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee. Isn't this a powerful promise? I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. What a promise. Yeah. But we need to be willing to cooperate with God to have the ABCs. In closing, we're going to share a song with you that's taken from Jeremiah 6.16, and it talks about standing back and looking at the way that God has led that we need to ask for the old paths, to return to those paths that God wants to lead us in. And it will require change for us as parents if we're willing to stand in those old paths and look for the way God is leading. Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is a good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Ye shall find rest for your souls. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein. Shall find rest for your souls. Jeremiah six sixteen. Thus saith the Lord, ye shall find rest for your souls. Shall we kneel together as we close? Father in heaven. We each one long for that complete rest that we can only find in complete surrender to Jesus Christ. Lord, we give ourselves to you that we will be the parents that you're calling us to be, that we will become the parents that only you can empower us to be, that we will give our children a heritage of the old paths of the way of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.